Hello everyone, this is Autumn Nims with International Women's Ministries. And I am sitting here with Beth Weeder. She is the founder of a ministry called Petals of Hope. And I'm so excited for her to be with us today because her ministry is a ministry of empowerment. Her ministry is a ministry of um, rescuing and restoring young girls and women and i'm just excited for her to be here with us to share her story and what god is doing through her and her husband tony but i wanted to share a scripture with you real quick because i believe it has a lot to do with the work that beth is doing and that is isaiah 117 learn to do good seek justice rebuke the oppressor defend the fatherless and plead the case of the widow you know beth the bible says it's a command to do good to others it's a command to rescue those that need to be rescued god says in his word that we are to care for the widows and the orphans and those that are less fortunate and when I think about your work, I think that's exactly what you're doing. And I got to see your work firsthand. And I, I really did not have a good picture in my mind till I went to Liberia and saw the work and saw how great it was and how vast it was and how much you had accomplished in just a very short time. But before we talk about your ministry, Beth, I wanted you to just share a little bit about your background, about how you, um, how God placed that desire in your heart to minister to women and girls and, and share a little bit about your testimony and, and how God used that testimony to put that desire in your heart. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's a blessing to have worked and still continue to work with you, even though we are on this lockdown. Yes. <laughs> you are in a different state. I'm in a different state at this point. But you have been a huge influence or a vital, uh, you know, vital encourager and partner for our ministry in Liberia. The way this entire ministry started i will tell you briefly about how it started and what caused it i come from liberia like autumn said my name is beth weeder and i'm a native of liberia i came from a muslim background and from my upbringing from the difficult times or things that i faced the lord laid on my heart after i became a christian to do likewise for mm -hmm. girls I came from a background that did not encourage the education of girls, let alone to give them the opportunity to be educated. And from a Muslim background, the male family members in my family stood against this. But my grandmother, who was a Muslim as well at the time, decided to send me to, to school to get an education. She refused for us to be like the other children of girls in my village and said i'm going to send my children my grandchildren to school and from her little effort of what she did the little pay that she got from being a trained midwife in our village she was able to send me and my sibling my girls i mean my sisters to school and today i am benefiting from her effort it was not easy she stood against culture she stood as a woman who has no place in society in Africa, she stood against everything. And I think God knew or believed that God knew what he wanted to make of my life. So he used her as, you know, uh, uh, used her in a special way that she would be able to lay that foundation for me. And from what I got, the Lord laid it on my heart also to do likewise for girls. I went through a civil war. Some of you may have heard about it or may not know. A brutal civil war that took place in Liberia. For 15 plus years, I suffered. I lived in a refugee camp. I almost lost my daughter. 
But after everything, I asked myself, why did God save me from this war? What can I do to give back to my people? Like Nehemiah, when they went into exile in Judah, and in the end, some people from there came back to Jerusalem, and he asked them, how's Jerusalem? And they started giving him information of what has happened in the city. The walls have broken down. Everything was destroyed. That's how I was. I felt like Nehemiah. And he decided to go back and build the walls. He invested in the lives of people. He went back. And God laid this on my heart so strongly to go back to Liberia. When we first left Ethiopia as missionaries with SIM and went to Liberia and saw the situation, the living condition, the suffering, especially for men, I mean, for girls and women, it broke our heart. My husband and I decided we have to do something. And when I thought about the school, he was afraid. He said, Beth, you can't do it. How can you start a school of all girls? Where do we get the money from? I said, God is going to provide. And surely God provided this for this school. And you, Autumn, you are one of those. When you came with me to Liberia for women's ministry and you saw how vulnerable some of these girls were, the need to build this school, you were there for the first time when little girls dressed in their khaki jumper with red blouses, excited, walking towards that building. Yes, that was, that was a the best joy. day. Yes. And you saw the need. We have built a school, the sixth classroom, but we did not have bathrooms. And you and Jack, okay, before leaving to come back to the States, you said, Beth, we're going to leave some money with you to build, to build these bathrooms. We had toilet. Yes. <laughs> running water. And today, our students are enjoying this gift. Amen. There are people in Liberia that do not even have an indoor plumbing, let alone toilet. But you provided by God's help. So. I mean, Autumn, this is my life. About the Civil War, to tell you a little bit of my, my own testimony, I came from that background. Yes. My mother, my father, could not read and write, and my mother cannot still write. And as I speak right now, she is still a Muslim that prays five times a day. She fasts during the month of Ramadan. She is still has not seen the light. And we pray every day that God will reveal this light to her. But I was like that. I grew up in such a life. But I can tell you, through the work of a missionary, and these are some of the very people you are ministering to today, Autumn, you go out of your way. You reach the lives of missionaries that are on the front line, working hard, sacrificing their lives, sacrificing their families to spread the word of God. This is what one missionary did that came to my home village, left their comfort, left everything. And in 1982, shared the word of God with me and I accepted Christ. From that time up to this time, my life has never been the same. But before I was tied up in different things that I did not even know. Coming from Islam, I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but female genital mutilations is one of the barbaric things that is in Africa. And let me assure you today, it is not only in Africa. People usually say, oh, female genital mutilation is thing done in Africa, the old stone age. My sisters, it's no longer in Africa alone. FGM, as it is called, is all over the world. And if you were to check, even in the backyard of your house, it may be happening there that you don't even know about. FGM is seriously something that is affecting women all over the world. In America, FGM is happening right here. In Michigan, three years ago, a doctor was cut his clinic does nothing but mutilating girls there in Michigan. In Europe or in London, 
London is known as the city, the capital of cutting. Because of immigrants that you allow in your society, which is great, it's wonderful because I'm one of those. But they are allowed and they come with all of these practices, doing them to their kids. They even import midwives from their home countries like Somalia, Egypt, Ethiopia into your country to the sole purpose of mutilating girls, their children. Some can be as young as one year old, six months old. Mm. This is a huge problem. And yes. I bet that is sitting here. The reason that I'm doing everything that I'm doing in Liberia and hopefully in other parts of Africa is because of the effect, the painful result of FGM. And as a woman, the effect, the side of FGM lasts on you for a lifetime. It is not just for the time it's done. When you are giving birth, it's a very difficult thing. If a doctor does not know about it, the woman will be injured and bleed to death. Mm. Sometimes babies died through childbirth. I could tell you a whole lot, but I challenge you and myself today, go and read about it. Millions of girls are at risk of FGM every year. So would you say that this is an abuse? Um, is this a cultural abuse or is this a religious abuse or is it a mixture of both? What, what would you say? I would tell you, seriously, it's a mixture of both. But how did FGM start? FGM started, and I'm now going to, into my second book that I'm writing. I'm not even done with it yet. But I'm talking about violence against women in Islam and other culture. FGM is a requirement for all Islamic women, for all Muslim women to undergo. It was an instruction that Muhammad gave to his followers. <sighs> It was given in the surah, one of the books for Muslims. And he said, do not, do not allow your women to go like men. Mutilate them so that that part of their body will not touch the man's organ. And that because women are always, I'm paraphrasing, but the, the reason behind this is that Muhammad believed that women are like she good. They are always in heat. Oh. And the only way that they can be controlled is to remove that part of their body. Can you imagine that? No. <laughs> as a woman, that part of your body is essential just as the male's organ is. <clears throat> and every day, baby girls are being mutilated. And I'm not going to go into detail about it, but there are four stages of female genital mutilations. And some goes as far as closing the urinary area. Wow. The opening and only leave a size of a match stick for the woman to urinate. If you don't believe it, read a book called, uh, uh, um, it's written by a Somali girl called, oh, What's her name? Ian Ali is in her book. If I think about it, I will get back to you with it. It is all written in there. They sew them. They took a needle and sew that raw part of the body and only leave a tiny space for urine to pass and menses when they are menstruating. And the night of their marriage, the woman is given to her husband for that night. So to consummate, uh, I mean to consummate the wedding uh -huh. for sexual intercourse, he is given a knife or a razor blade to cut her open so that he can have sex with her. How cruel yes. these practices are. So they are a mixture of both. Muhammad gave it for his Muslims, I mean for his followers to follow it. But today, even people who are not Muslims, but for cultural belief are still doing it. And the one reason is, when you are in a community, in a village, and when a man hears that you are not circumcised 
or mutilated, he would not marry you because he, they feel that you are unclean. I don't even know how to respond to that. It just makes me speechless. And I can only imagine that these young girls and women just feel so degraded and so embarrassed and less than what God designed them to be, you know, and the, the emotional um, baggage that must come with that, which makes your work in Liberia that much harder because not only are you um, rescuing these girls and you're giving them an education and you're trying to show them they can have a better life, but you have to a deal, you have to deal with the emotional baggage that comes along with these cultural practices. Yes, yes. It's a lot. We have to deal with all of this. And the school is only for girls. So when parents come to register their kids, we tell them upfront that we do not believe in the mutilation of girls. And if you agree on that, you have to sign an agreement that you will not take your daughter from here and take her to be mutilated. Mm -hmm. But when you do, and we find out, we will fight by all means to take that child from you because we believe that is an abuse of her right. She is not the one that is agreeing to be subjected to it, but it is because of you. And let me tell you, Autumn, the sad thing about this is that mothers, grandmothers are the ones that initiate these behaviors, these cultural practices. Mm -hmm. But of course, not without the demand of their fathers or their husbands. Mm. Yeah. So I was in Liberia with you. By the way, you've authored one book already. What's the title of that book? The title of my first book is called, it's called Out of the Ashes, My Joining from Tragedy to Redemption. So folks out there, if you want to read more about Beth's story, because it is a, one, it's a God story, and it's, it's Beth's testimony, but it will reveal to you why she has such a passion for um, girls coming out of the very situation that she came out of, and why she wants to raise them up and give them an education and empower them as young girls and women to take charge of their own lives mm -hmm. and um, to trust the Lord with their path. The one true God, not Allah, mm -hmm. but the one true God that, that um, gave his only son to die on a cross for us. And that's her mission in Liberia to um, reach as many girls as possible with the gospel of Christ mm -hmm. and to give them an education because when you know Jesus and when you have an education on top of that, you see yourself as Christ sees you. You don't see yourself as damaged goods anymore. No. You see yourselves as a beautiful package a story that god has put together to be a testimony to the world and many of these girls tragically don't feel like they have anything to offer to the world around them but you're trying to counter that right amen yep amen yep but i i had the chance to go to liberia and see beth's work first firsthand i took a team of women and we held some women's conferences there and the one thing that really struck me with Liberia is how closed the women are to one another. Mm. When we would, in one church, we held a women's conference and they didn't even want to pray with another woman in the group. They wanted to get you off privately where they could share with you, um, what was going on in their lives, but they did not want to do it in a group setting because there's just a general lack of trust amongst the people there because of the civil war, because then 
everybody had to get over on every, someone else because um, that was survival. Mm -hmm. Nobody had food. No one had, you know, a means to buy and sell. It was just a desperate situation. And so what you had were people just taking advantage of each other, trying to get ahead mm -hmm. to feed their families, to um, take care of their sick. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, and because of that, the, the mentality of the Civil War is still there. It is. And honestly, many of the women that we met um, were still living out the Civil War with everything they were sharing with us. It was still as if it happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, just rapes mm -hmm. and brutal beatings and left for dead, many of these women. And... They, they each had a similar story. It was almost like you were hearing the same story over and over and over again, but with a different woman's point of view. It was really heartbreaking to see. But then I saw the hope of Christ Amen. and what you have to offer in Liberia to the women who only saw darkness at that time and who who are still, they still have walls up mm -hmm. because of the Civil War. But Beth, you are chipping away at those walls. You are, you know, taking a chisel and you're mm -hmm. like, no, we got, we got it. You got to know Christ. You got If you know him, you know who you are. Mm -hmm. You are not what happened to you in the Civil War. You are not what someone did to you through yes. female genital mutilation. Mm -hmm. You are a child of the King, mm -hmm. and you have rights as a believer. And mm -hmm. Then, you know, just the girls' home how organized it was, the, how dedicated the teachers are. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Seeing the pride that the young girls took in putting on that school uniform. Yes. And how they marched into school. Yes. Was, I mean, you could, standing up tall, excited that they got to have an education. Yes. And mm -hmm. that was a big thing because boys are usually educated first. First, yeah. mm -hmm. And very poor families, that's what they will do. They will educate their boys first. Mm -hmm. And girls just are forgotten many times. And um, so that was another cultural shift that I saw that you were trying to make. Mm -hmm. And just the, the pride those girls were taking in securing that education with your team. and and how much they were investing in their schoolwork. And, the, you know, the way they came into school every day, on every, time. Every day. Ready yeah. to learn. You know, American kids aren't so excited about doing that every day, are they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah they, but you're doing that. Yeah. But you, you see when it's an opportunity that's not offered to you, how they do not take it for granted and that they want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell me Beth now, how are things with the COVID-19 virus and um, how is that impacting your ministry right now? Well, we are in a unique time of our faith as we see what the virus is doing, not only in America, not only in the West, but even right now, how it's affecting Africa, the entire continent. It's a sad thing. And especially, I'm more worried about, of what's gonna happen in Africa, because already our infrastructure is so bad. Health is to the worst of it cord in every African country, almost every African country, except for maybe South Africa. But, the, the virus is affecting everything. Right now, as we speak, schools have been closed down. On my Facebook chat, I put something, on my Facebook post, 
I posted something about the ill treatment of people in Liberia, how they are beating them. They gave them only five to six hours a day to be out. And these are people that don't have anything. In a day, a woman must go and seek for a job or work somewhere in a home, wash dishes, clean clothes, in order to get money, like 25, the equivalent of 25 to 50 cents a day to buy food for their family. So in the morning, for those hours, how much time do they have to go out and work? It's not much. By the time they are done, three o'clock, everything must shut down in the country, market and everything. So she has no means of going out. So the, the government house has asked for people to be beaten in the street so that they would, when they see them out. So the, the virus is affecting Liberia so badly, just like any other African country that has no means of survival. The economy, our economy is, was for normal days, is 80, 80 to 85% of unemployment. And think about what is happening right now. People are desperate. Yeah. In fact, we just wrote a prayer letter for Petals of Hope, where we want to raise money and buy bags of rice and distribute it to some of our students and their families. We are in the process of paying synthesis to sew masks that we can distribute within communities just to save people. So kids are not in school. It has affected the school. It has affected everything. Even for us that live on support and have to raise support for our teachers, we are doing that now by mouth, calling supporters. Because as you gave from here overseas, you have been affected as well. That is why I said we are in a unique time of our faith today. Because with the little you have, you are able to support a child or a teacher overseas. But if you cannot give or you can get yourself on employment is at I don't even know, six point something million now in America, it is a tough time. But in it all, we are trusting God. Amen. I know people are quarantined, but we cannot be quarantined as Christians. Our prayers should be out there praying. Amen. The word of God is not quarantined. We can stand on the foundation of our faith and claim God's promises to give to our people, to bring healing. And that is my prayer. That is my prayer. We don't know why God is allowing this pandemic at such a time, as the president called it, a plague. We don't know. But my hope and prayer is, Adam, that we as Christians will be allowed to be used by God at this time. Yeah. We will allow ourselves to stand in the gap, to pray for our neighbors, to pray for our brothers and sisters overseas, to pray for their need, to ask God to open their heart of all things that they will receive Christ as Lord and personal Savior. I mean, we are all on the same level now, whether a millionaire, as poor as I am, or even poorest of the poor, we are all equal. Your money cannot save you from the virus. It is only God. Right. So for what reason God is allowing this? Maybe he wants us to lift up our heads and look up to heaven and not to look within ourselves every day. So my prayer is that God will use this to spread the gospel, to bring a revival, not only in America, but all over the world. Amen. All over the world. Amen. Yeah, this is not a time for Christians to be still, is it? No, not at all. And Beth, as... As folks out there are watching, how can they pray for your ministry and for you and Tony right now? Right now, pray for us that we, we may remain faithful, for Tony and I to remain faithful. God has called us to a huge task than ever before. That is working with the church that we are working with here in Kentucky. We are seeing doors opening, especially for Muslim ministry, which he is, he has been assigned to. Amen. God is opening doors. I mean, Kentucky and Cincinnati are one of the states that have a huge number of Muslims 
and we are trying to reach to them. Pray that we remain faithful and that God will give us wisdom and discernment to reach out to Muslims. And I will tell you one thing, one of the largest people groups to reach and the hardest is Islam. Because the enemy, the devil, has blinded them so badly. Hmm. You think of Iraq, you think of Iran and other places, Islamic places. People are afraid to even reach them with the word of God because they believe that they are terrorists. They believe that they, they will kill you or cause you harm. But these are the people that God has called us to. Like I said, my second book is mostly on the violence of Islam towards women. Pray that I will stand firm in his word and not fear and believe that he's going to protect me. For the work in Liberia, pray that our teachers, our principal, will all be strong and safe from this virus. We just started the foundation of our school building. We built a six-room classroom that you saw when you were there. But in November of last year, we went and broke ground and started a foundation of a school building from elementary up to high school. Pray that God will provide the funds for this school. It would be a unique place for women. We want this campus to be the highlight of Liberia, but especially for women. You know, let me leave one thing with you. As African, I believe when you educate a woman, you educate a village, a community, a society, and a country. Why? Yeah. Because we women, in Africa especially, have a huge influence on our children. Most of the time, we are left alone to train them. So what an impact a mother or a girl in my school will be making in the future of her children and the next generation. Amen. Pray for us. I will. Thank you. And I'm going to challenge everybody out there watching to pray for this ministry because it has an impact on a nation and it has the opportunity to turn the tide mm -hmm. and to save many lives yeah. and to, like you said, change the violence of in Islam into the love of Christ. Amen. Amen. That's what you're doing. That's what we are doing. Our school is a Christian school. We are reaching the lives of these kids every day. They are taking Bible. You know, America taught us when I was growing up, Bible was taught in school, in the public school. You taught us to do that because there were missionaries that were in my home country teaching me. But today, Bible has been removed from your school building. But we still have it. We still carry on. And we hope that the Bible will be an inspirational book to our students. And before I forget, before we close, the name of the book that I was talking about is called Infidel by mm -hmm. Ian Ali. Read it. It's an eye opener on the treatment of women in Africa. Okay. Thank you for that information. And sister, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. We so appreciate your testimony and your story. And you know, your testimony in particular always causes me to ask the question, am I doing enough for the kingdom of God? I see what you and Tony are doing. You're working in an Islamic community um, through a church in Kentucky, a large Islamic community. You're trying to um, share the love of Christ there. And then you're going all the way around the world to Liberia to work in the communities there. And I just, you know, you guys are amazing to me. And, and it's proof that one person can make a difference, right? Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. Yeah. I'm just thankful to know you, sister. And I can consider it a privilege and an honor for International Women's Ministries to be able to partner with you the way we do. Amen. And you have been great. You have been wonderful. Twice you've been to Liberia. And I hope and pray that you will come there again as soon as travels are open. We would love for you to come and see what you started. These girls, man, when I see them, I'm so fulfilled. I mean, these kids could not read or write. Now we have fourth grade. 
And I went there and saw the writing of some of these children reciting memory verses during that time of devotion, I mean devotion in the morning. It is amazing, sister. Come and see what you've started. Amen. I'm excited. God bless you, sister. Thank you. God bless you, my dear. Thank you.